We've talked about getting offended by other people. We've talked about us not offending other people. But today I want to talk to you about someone that you probably haven't thought about offending. Offending yourself. That's what we're going to talk about today. Not offending yourself. Last week, Pastor Shane talked about that cycle of offense offense that we talked about. And it ultimately can lead to hate. And hate leads to a loveless life. And I totally agree with that because if you don't love yourself, if you're constantly cutting yourself down, we're going to offend ourselves and we're going to end up hating who we are. And I think if we were honest, there's some of us in this room, we want to be loved, but we don't even love ourselves. And I want to help you today to quit offending yourself by discounting yourself, knocking yourself down, cutting yourself down, and living a loveless life for yourself. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of people who offend themselves and they don't even realize it. Because they do things that offend their spirit. And they wonder why they're in the situation that they're in. Why life has turned out the way that it has. And I think we can look at some things today that can help us figure this out. Have you ever thought about the fact that you have a relationship with yourself? I know that sounds a little weird. You spend more time with you than anybody. I mean... You're the one person you can't get away from. No matter how hard you try, you're always going to be with you, right? So you can't get away for even for a second. So the problem is, if you you don't like yourself, you're setting yourself up for a pretty miserable life. There are some things that offend our spirit that I want to talk to us about today. Some things that can cause some internal problems. And maybe you're sitting here today, you're saying, I don't like my life. I wish my life was different. I wish this would change or that would change. Well, here's one thing that I think that we can do or that we do that offends ourselves. Number one, being self-critical. Judging ourselves. Other people get offended when you judge them, don't they? Don't you think people get offended when you judge them? Well, if we're constantly judging ourselves, then we're offending ourselves. If we're self-critical, self-judgmental, self-condemning, doubting ourselves, you're offending you. You're setting yourself up to have problems with who you are. Now, as believers, yes, we need to examine ourselves and and look at our life in light of God's Word. Are there things that I need to change? Are there things that I need to do better? We always need to do some self-introspection. But if there's some things that we need to work on, then the Holy Spirit's going to help us deal with that. But we don't need to judge ourselves, always looking for something that's wrong. So many of us are so self-analytical. We're always looking for something wrong in our lives, and we can't appreciate some of the things that God has already done that's going right in our lives. So think about it. How is your relationship with you? Not with your neighbor, not with your spouse, not with your children. How is your relationship with you? Can you stand to be alone with yourself? Do you like having some alone time? I love spending some alone time. And this may shock you, but most people don't have a very good relationship with themselves. And so therefore, they don't have a good relationship with other people. Because we said it two weeks ago. Love your neighbor, the Bible says, as you love yourself. If you don't get along with you, you're not going to get along with other people. Let me say that again. If you don't get along with you, you're not going to get along with other people. You want other people to like you, but you don't even like you. You're trying to sell someone a product that you haven't even bought in on yourself. So quit trying to win over other people. Win yourself over. See who you are in Christ Jesus. Let him show you who you were created to be. You're your, his unique, wonderful masterpiece. Yes. With imperfections. And he loves us even with our issues. But if you're critical of yourself, you're going to be critical of others. If you're hard on yourself, you're going to be hard on other people. But if you can receive God's mercy and grace for yourself... You're going to be able to extend that mercy and grace to other people. If you can learn to love you, you're going to learn to love other people. But if you can't receive God's mercy and grace for yourself, you can't extend it. I mean, it's simple. You can't give what you don't have. Let me say that again. You can't love people if you don't have love. If you're thirsty, I can give you something because I got water, right? Right? If you came up to me and said, I'm thirsty, I'm like, well, I can help you out. I got water. But if you ask for something I don't have, I can't give it to you. And we're walking around in a world where people don't love themselves. They're looking for love. And when you don't love yourself, you have no love to give them. And we're walking around in a dry, parched, 
thirsty world looking for somebody that's got some water. So I want to ask you today, what are you full of? What are you full of? Because you can't give what you don't have. So I'm asking you today, get you some Jesus time. Get you some alone time with God. Learn to love who you are in him. And when you can love you, you can love other people. And when you love other people, people are going to love you. And it's just that reciprocal thing where it keeps filling you up over and over and over again. I'm excited. Because to be able to give love, you've got to receive love. And let's be honest. Can, I be, can we be honest in here for a minute? Some folks in this room are just harsh and abrasive. Bottom line, you're hard to get along with. You constantly offend other people and you excuse it for just you being you. Baby, if you were a flavor at Baskin Robbins, you'd be the full bucket because nobody would want a spoonful of it. The root issue is you can't get along with other people because you can't get along with yourself you got to have a right relationship with yourself first. And here's, here's what I see. Here's where I think how we get into this situation. We set such high standards for ourselves, And when we don't meet those standards, we get upset with us. So to make ourselves feel better, we have to cut everybody else down and pick them apart to make ourselves feel better. Because see, here's the thing. You ever seen it? Someone who lives in a home where they're controlled by their spouse or their, their kids or whoever... When you feel like you can't control you, you try to control others. Because if you can't control you, you're going to find something that you can, and that leads to a death loop and cycle. So again, how's your relationship with you? Are you always criticizing yourself? Or can you at least look in the mirror like that old saying that they used to say when I was younger? I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm not who I need to be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be. Because when I look at me, I've I've got a long way to go. But I've 100% made some progress. Why can't we find some joy in how far we've come instead of being depressed about how far we've got to go? Let me say it again. Why can't we find some joy in how far we've come instead of being depressed about how far we've got to go? Think about it. God's not critical. He doesn't have a critical spirit. He has a Holy Spirit. The devil has a critical spirit. And hear this. It doesn't make you more holy or godly by looking for everything that's wrong in yourself. That's just depressing and it gets exhausting. I speak to God every day and I think if I speak to him and there's something in me that he wants to change, don't you think he'll mention it? Don't you think he'll mention it to me? Before he's going to mention it to you. God's going to try to talk to you if you'll just give him an ear and listen. So I choose to celebrate how far I've come. And not beat myself down for how far I've got to go. I'm going to work on myself. Me and God, the Holy Spirit, we're going to work on me. You let you and the Holy Spirit work on you. But listen, when Jesus comes back, we're still going to have some work that we need to do. We're not going to be perfect till we get to heaven. But we need to get up every day and do our best to follow him. Celebrate how far you've come and all that God's done in your life. Don't always be knocking yourself down, getting on your own case. Work on you. But give yourself a break. Show a little mercy and grace to yourself. And if you do, I think you're going to love your life a little bit better. Because when I first got saved, I thought, I, I thought that's what I needed to do. I constantly looked for stuff. I needled myself to death. I constantly looked for stuff. I need to change. I need to change. I need to change. And it was with a good, innocent heart. I wanted to be better. But I was nitpicking myself apart to where I felt like I wasn't any good. And somehow I thought that made me more spiritual. So I developed a problem of constantly judging and criticizing myself. Always finding everything that I do that's wrong. The devil left me alone because I was doing a whole lot better at doing his job of tearing myself down so he didn't need to work on me no more. So quit tearing yourself down. There's always going to be people that are critical and judgmental of you. Just don't you be one of them. Just don't be one of them. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 3 in the Amplified Version says, So then let us apostles be looked upon as ministering servants of Christ and stewards or trustees of the mysteries, the secret purposes of God. 
Moreover, it is essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. But as for me personally, it matters very little to me. This is Paul's talking. It matters very little to me that I should be put on trial by you on this point. And that you or any other human in tribunal should investigate and question and cross-question me. I do not even put myself on trial and judge myself. So apparently people were judging Paul. Saying they didn't believe that he was being faithful. And he said, I don't care what you think. I don't even judge myself, so I'm not going to let you judge me. God is going to judge me. He knew that whatever he was doing wrong, God was going to show him because he spent time with God Every day. And if you're spending time with God, he's going to show you everything in your life that you need to work on and change. And if he does choose to use other people, and he does at times, it's going to be iron sharpening iron, and it's always going to be done in love, and it's not going to be done in judgment. Iron sharpening iron. Because there's a difference in being judgmental and showing loving correction. People are really big on that today. Don't judge me. Don't you judge me. But when people are close to us and they see an error or sin in our life and they want to talk to you and I about it, that's not always judgment and condemnation. Let me, let me give you a little bit of definition of what, what condemnation and conviction are. Condemnation paralyzes us and makes us see no hope to change. When you feel condemned, you just feel like, I'm never going to be any better than this. And you, and you just start beating yourself down. Conviction motivates us to want to change and draw closer to God. Which do you think comes from the enemy and which comes from God? God is a convictor, not a condemner. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Conviction makes you want to run to God. Condemnation makes you want to run from God. And you got to pick. So ask God to show you what you need to change, to convict you, to correct you, and he will. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, I am not conscious of anything against myself, and I feel blameless. But I am not vindicated and acquitted before God on that account. It is the Lord himself who examines and judges me. See, God judges. Paul is saying, it's not your job to judge yourself, and it's not your job to judge me. It's God's job to convict me. Too many people live under condemnation. But again, condemnation doesn't come from God. Guilt and condemnation is like a weight. It's like a millstone around your neck. But conviction comes from the Holy Spirit to change you, to better you, to make you want to be closer to Him. Our walk with God, church, is a process. And we don't become the finished work all at once. I wish we did. But He'll keep refining us until the day that He returns. 1 Peter 5.10 says, and after you've suffered a little while, don't you just love that? And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely, and strengthen and settle you. After you have suffered a little while. How many of you wish you could just erase that out of the Bible? I mean, why do you think you have to suffer first? Let me clarify. Here's what suffering here actually means. Because usually when people see something in themselves that needs to change, what do they do? They try to change it themselves. And after a while of you trying to change yourself, you realize that doesn't work so well. And you wear yourself out and therefore that's what the suffering is. After you've suffered a little while, after, after you realize, I can't do this. And God goes, I know. After you said, I need to change this, God goes, I know. And so you try to change it on your own because you don't have the power within yourself to do it. Not the way that God can. And you wear yourself out and therefore, after you've suffered a little while, the God of grace shows up. The Holy Spirit never intended for you to change yourself. The old me would have gone to a service like this, hear this message, and immediately realize, oh my gosh, I've got a problem. Maybe I'm too negative. Maybe I'm too critical. So I'd go home and I'd be determined to change. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be different. All on my own willpower. And then when I fail, guess what I do? I get discouraged. So then I go, you know what? I'm just not going to even talk to anybody. I'm just going to keep to myself. Because I just keep offending everybody and everybody says I'm being negative. 
So I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to talk to anyone. And then you wake up and your family goes, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you talking? You mad? And then you get upset and go, oh my gosh, I can't please anybody. I talk to people and they get upset. I don't talk to people and they get upset. I just can't win. I give up. Well, what was I doing? I was trying to fix myself. And in the process of trying to fix myself, what else was I doing? I was suffering. I was suffering. And that's what Peter, Paul meant here. And after you suffered a little while, sure, there's things in your life that you can change. And with the Holy Spirit's help, you're going to work on it. But there are some things you just... You could stop doing if you wanted to. But there are some things that only you can stop doing with God's help. You need the power of God. It's heart stuff. Stuff that you can't change on your own. You know, when I realized there were some things in my life that I was doing that I didn't even realize I was doing, you know what there was called? Blind spots. And we all have blind spots. So I needed the Holy Spirit to show me those things because I didn't see them. And when I grasped that, that's when I was able to not be mad at myself for not being perfect. And then I started worshiping God instead of worrying about the mess that I was. Because worship is what wins the war, not worry. The battle's not mine. The battle belongs to God. And you may be a mess, but guess what? You're God's mess. I may be a mess at times. You may be a mess at times, but we're God's mess. And if anybody's going to change us, he will if we'll spend some time with him. 1 Peter 5.10, the God of all grace will com himself complete and make you what you ought to be. Why does God allow us to go through this stuff? I believe it's because when we finally get free, he wants us to know where that freedom came from. I think he wants us to know exactly why we're free and who got us free. Because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Right now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Right now, making an intercession, intercession for you and me. So why, if he's going to intercede for you, why would he condemn you? He's not going to condemn you. So if God's not condemning you, then who is? If you're sitting here today and you feel condemned, who's condemning you? It's either the devil or you're condemning yourself. Because remember, condemnation is different than conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts you, but the devil sure wants to condemn you. You know, I've discovered that the more I try to change myself, the worse I usually get. Because I get frustrated with myself and I feel defeated. But when I trust in God, that's when things start to change. When I quit trying to fix me, and I say, God, you know, there's some things that I know that you're showing me, and you want to help me. You didn't show them to me to torment me. You showed them to me to help me change. And therefore, then I get closer to God, and then things start to change, and then I become, become better. And I begin to thank Jesus, because it's all about him. It's not about me. The second thing you do to offend yourself is you have a bad attitude towards yourself. You know, a lot of times we can have a bad attitude towards ourselves. I mean, again, we're going to dip back into what we talked about a moment ago. You should like who you are. You need to get along with yourself. Sure, again, you've got things that you need to work on. We all do, but we're not because we're not the finished product. But you know what? I like me. Not arrogantly and not pridefully, but I like who God's created me to be. I know who my identity and my purpose and my life goal and plan is. It's in Him. If you don't like you, are you shocked that other people don't like you? Because for years I hated myself. But God's helped me to love me. I like me. I enjoy my alone time with me. Just me and Jesus. And I think it makes the devil's job a whole lot harder when you learn to love yourself. You know, I've had some people say some pretty ugly stuff about me over the years, and so I can hear it now. That pastor at High Point on Sunday, he said he loves himself. I bet he does. He's just so full of himself. I'm not talking about being arrogant or being conceited. I'm talking about looking in the mirror and liking what you see looking back at you. Amen. That you see God. Amen. That you see his child. Because seriously, it's about liking you and who God has made you to be. And what he's doing in you. James 3, 2 says, For we often stumble and fall and offend in many things. And if anyone does not offend in speech, never says wrong things, 
He is a fully developed character and a perfect man, able to control his whole body and to curb his entire nature. How many of you have the ability to never say anything wrong? Don't raise your hand because you'd be... Because you'd be. I don't know about you, but I'm not a perfect person. But I'm in pursuit of it. I want to be perfected in Christ, and I'm going to be continually being made perfect in his image every single day as I pursue him. But how you talk about yourself is very important. I mean, think back over the last week. What are the things that you've said to yourself? Maybe not out loud, but in your brain. You're so stupid. You're so dumb. Oh, my gosh. Don't let negative talk and critical things come out of your mouth about yourself. I mean, James 3.2 talks about offending with our speech. You can offend yourself and offend the Holy Spirit that's living in you. Because listen, Jesus came to die for you. God sent his only son to die for you because he thought you were worth that much. So he paid a huge price for your freedom. And if God loves you enough to do that, then who do you think you are to hate yourself? Who do you think you are to hate yourself? Satan doesn't want you to get a hold of that. God's love for you so that you learn to love you too. So to quit offending yourself by saying negative things about your stuff. Stop comparing yourself to other people. I wish I had your looks. I wish I had your job. I wish I had your career. I wish I had your muscles. I wish I had your car. Guess what? You don't. I wish I had your life. Well, you don't. You have the life that God gave you, so learn to love it and be glad in it. And if you want to change some things, then work on it. Well, pastor, but if you had my life, you wouldn't love it. You wouldn't say that. Maybe not. But you got to start where you are if you ever want to get to where you want to be. you got to start where you are today if you ever want to get where you want to be. We all want to improve. We all want to get better. But there's going to be some things you have to change along the way. But it's not going to help if you hate where you are right now. Some of you keep wanting to love where you're going to be, but you're hating where you are right now, which is ruining your life right now, which means you're not going to get where you need to be. I hate the way I look. Then do something about it. Pastor, what do you expect me to do? And some of you look shocked like right now. Maybe don't eat so much. Go to the gym, bathe, comb your hair, brush your teeth, fix yourself up a little bit. Iron your clothes. Use some mouthwash. Do you know what I walk up here with every single week? Shiloh, my assistant, make sure I do. These, why? Because it don't matter how good my prayer is if you can't listen to my prayer because of my stanky breath. So you want people to like you? Do something about it. You don't like what you look like? Do something about it. You want your spouse to look at you the way they did when you first met? Then put in the same effort you did when you first met. Get out of the frumpy pajamas and sweats all the time. And I know you, you want to feel better. I feel better about myself sometimes when I fix myself up and I get all duded up, don't you? So put in a little extra work. If you want to, don't want to go to the gym, buy you some spanks. Buy yourself a man girdle. I'll give you some 411. Do you know for years when I was at my biggest, I had on a man girdle every single Sunday. I was so tight. If I breathed, I'd probably kill people for three rows. <laughs> If that thing had busted loose, people would walk up behind me and they would hit me on the back and it would be like, boom, boom, boom. Why? Because, man, everything was so tight up in there. All it would take is a few stitches to pop and people would die. But here's the thing. If you don't like what you got, then work with what you can work with and make the changes that you can and let God do the rest. Because there's a lot of stuff about your life that only you can fix. God's not going to slap them potato chips out of your hand and drive you to the gym. Church, it's time for you to start loving your life and grab yourself some joy. We only got one life, so let's live it to the fullest. Because here's, here's what I was thinking this, yesterday morning, and, I, and this was fresh into these notes. If today was my last day, I'd hate to think I spent it being miserable. You don't know if today's your last day or not. It could be. Do you want your family to remember, oh my gosh, they died. And they were such a jerk yesterday. Adios. Because the devil, the thief, only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus came to give you life and give it to you for the fullest. So cut yourself some slack. Quit inventorying everything that's wrong with you. 
God will change you if he wants it to change, if you'll stay in his word. Stop saying negative and critical things about yourself. I'm ugly. I'm fat. I'm stupid. What's that going to accomplish? Because if you keep doing that, you're doing nothing more than offending yourself. I'm not saying live in denial. If you got stuff to change, change it if you can. But I believe the reason that a lot of people are so unhappy is because of the dumb stuff they let come out of their mouth. Love being you. Say good stuff about yourself. Tell yourself, I love the life that God has given me. And sure, there may be extenuating circumstances. Maybe you're in a situation where there's abuse. And I'm not condoning that. If that's the case, report the abuse. Don't stay in the situation. Reach out for help. Do what you can do. And I can hear it now. Pastor Derek, I'm not going to say I love my life because that would be a lie. I hate my life. The Bible says call those things that aren't as though they are. Don't speak in denial, speak in faith. Ezekiel said, can these dry bones live? Speak to your dry boned life that God would bring life to your dry and weary heart. If you don't like your life, start speaking the word of God over it. You think I'm lying? Proverbs 18, 20. A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. Your life is going to be filled with the fruit of what you speak. And with the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied, whether good or evil. Words have consequences. The Bible says you're going to be satisfied with the consequences of your own words. You're going to have to be satisfied. You're going to have to say, this is the life I've got because these are the words that I've spoken over myself. You reap what you sow. So be careful what you speak. The next verse, verse 21 in Proverbs 18 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for life or death. Much of our life that we're living is a result of the words that we spoke over the life that we're living. And if you'll start talking better about yourself, I think you'll start living better. Before your feet hit the the floor in the morning, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. I choose peace today. I choose joy today. I'm not going to compare myself to anybody else. I'm not going to dwell on what I don't have and what I can't do or what other people aren't doing for me. How many of you need an attitude transplant? I know I do. It's just kind of like I I, I need somebody with a good attitude to give me theirs. We'll get around people with a good attitude. Third thing that I think we offend ourselves with is self-doubt. We make, a che- we make a decision and change our mind. We make a decision and we change our mind. We keep second-guessing ourselves. We have self-doubt. Well, let's end that today. And you know why I think we doubt ourselves a lot of times spiritually? Is we're so afraid of missing God. How many of you think we serve a big God? Amen. Well, how many of you think if your little self misses God, that he's able to find you? If you miss him, he can find you. He left the 99 to go look for the one. Because God's not all caught up in your imperfections. He just wants a relationship with you. And if you do your best to hear from God and you make a mistake, God's big enough to get you back on track. And this isn't to say go live your life all willy-nilly and don't worry about making mistakes because God will come get me. Don't make him come get you. Do your best to hear from him. But you can't live your life in torment of self-doubt all the time. James 1.5 says... If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault finding, and it will be given to you. You want wisdom? Ask God for it. And I love that. You got a problem? Ask God to help you with it. The Bible not only says will he help you, but he's not going to find fault with you in the process. That means if you've gotten yourself in a mess, if you've gotten yourself in a pickle, if you'll go to God... He'll help, you love, he'll help love you out of it. Doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences. It doesn't mean that he's not going to correct you in the process of it. But he's not going to condemn you. Moving on to James 1, 6 to 8, it says, Only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering or hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers and hesitates and doubts is like the billowing surge out at sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. 
For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. For being as he is, a man with, of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, he is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels, and decides. Here's the thing. I prayed this last week. And I believe this to be the message that God wants every person in this room to hear today. But how you respond to that message is on you. I've walked off this stage too many Sundays second-guessing, self-doubting that message. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have told that story. And I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to keep living my life like that anymore. When we speak the Word of God, the Word of God does not return void. Amen? The devil may come at you and, and, and say crazy stuff to you like, well, what if you make a mistake? Well, what if you do? You're human. You need to tell the devil, what if I make a mistake? At least my mistake wasn't as big as your dumb mistake that you made taking on the living God. <laughs> Who are you to talk? Stir up those gifts within you. Don't take no junk off the devil. So let's do a little recap. Stop offending yourself by being so self-critical, so self-judgmental. Believe that you can hear from God. Because God doesn't want you to live a life of confusion. God's not the author of, the conf of confusion. The enemy is. So here's how I want to wrap up today. Talk about the thing that you all have been waiting to hear about. Sin. Right? Yay! We're going to talk about sin. Because the most offensive thing we can allow in our life is sin and not deal with it. There are some things in life that you can't do anything about. But then there are some things that you can absolutely 100% do something about. And when you can do something about it, do something about it. So we need to ask ourselves, what in my life can I do something about? Are there things that I don't want to change because I don't want to deal with it? Do I keep making excuses for things in my life because I want to act like there's nothing wrong? Are there things that I should pray about, but I don't? And are there some things that I need to stop praying about and just do something about it? Matthew 18, 8 says, and if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble and sin, and the word stumble here means to offend, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble and sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. It's better, more profitable and wholesome for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into an everlasting fire. Amen. And if your eye causes you to stumble and sin, plug it out, throw it away from you. It's better, more profitable and wholesome for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, the Gehenna of fire. This is an analogy, folks. So please do not go around cutting off your hands and plucking out your eyes, all right? I don't want to have to do any hospital visits. But here's what he's saying. If you're allowing things in your life to keep offending you, cut it off. If it's judging yourself, stop it. Cut it off. If it's talking critically and negatively about yourself, cut it off. It may not stop overnight, but work on it. And if it's sin, repent of it. Turn from it. You know what? We've got to quit sugarcoating sin and calling it our problem, our issue, our struggle. Call it what it is. Sin is sin. And Christ died for our sins, so we need to call it what it is. You know, I think that's one of the biggest issues with our society today. No one wants to call sin, sin anymore. We need to repent and confess our sins. And why to do it? Because when we confess our sins and admit them, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And I want his forgiveness. Talk openly with God about your sin. Quit trying to hide it. He's God. He sees it. He saw you when you did it. Name it and say, Lord, forgive me. Because anything you try to hide has power over you. What is Satan's nickname? Prince of Darkness. And where do you hide your secrets? In the light or the dark? You hide them in the dark. So every time you hide a sin in the dark, you give the prince of darkness power over your life. So drag that bad boy out into the light and deal with it so the enemy doesn't have power over you anymore. Confess it. And here's the kicker. God not only wants you to talk to him about it, sometimes he wants you to talk to somebody else about it. Not necessarily the every case, every time. But sometimes you need to talk to someone. James 5, 16 says, Confess to one another 
Therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. We confess to God for forgiveness. That affects our relationship eternally. We confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to one another to find healing. Now, when you confess to someone, it needs to be somebody spiritually mature. Don't seek spiritual advice from somebody who's not spiritual or knows God. Make sure it's somebody that you know is not going to spread your business, somebody that you can trust. We need to be able to trust each other in the body of Christ. How many of you believe that? I think we need to be trustworthy people that when people tell us something, it doesn't go any further, that we don't go spread everybody else's business. We need to be the kind of person that when someone tells us something, we know they know that we're not going to go and blab it. And we're not going to judge them and we're not going to criticize them. Because you know why I think there's so much sin in the body of Christ? Or why people don't find the ultimate healing from sin? It's because they don't trust each other. We don't trust each other. And we miss out on that James 5.16 healing. So to decide today that I'm going to find me a trustworthy friend. And then you be that friend. Be that friend to others. You know, some people, we all know people. We don't want to point. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. You know what? I think if we started being truthful with one another in church, in love, I think we'd grow a lot faster. But we don't want to tell people the truth. We'll tell somebody else the truth about somebody, but we won't tell that person to their face about the truth about themselves. Some people have a reputation of being that know-it-all tells it all. Don't be that person because loose lips, what? Sink ships. Because we live in a very sin-filled world, but don't even flirt with sin. Sin hurts God. Sin hurts us. It offends our soul. So you're here, sitting here today, we get offended. Why? When you allow sin in your life, it is offensive to your spirit. And it affects your relationship with yourself. It affects your relationship with other people. And it affects your relationship with God. So repent, which means turn from it. And when you don't have peace about something, listen to the Holy Spirit and cut it out of your life. Well, pastor, I hear you. But you know you're older. And what you're saying is kind of old-fashioned. You know, we live in a new day. We live in a new generation. And everybody else is doing it. Christians down the street, they're doing it. My buddy in Ohio, he's doing it. My buddy in Tennessee, he's doing it. I, you know, I mean, because I think back years ago, it used to be considered a sin. But it's not a sin anymore. What? Sin is sin, no matter how much society tries to normalize it. Come on, say it again. And I'm not trying to get all up in, in the gravy and all political and all that kind of stuff, but the opening of the Olympics this last week was disgusting. Amen. It shows how far our world has fallen. Because the world is saying sin doesn't matter and is making a mockery of Christianity. And saying that sin is normal. Sin is not normal. It's the worst excuse we could give. Because there's a lot of things that other Christians might do, and I'm not here to make myself sound elite or, or elevate myself. But I think we've gotten too comfortable in the overall church world with sin. I think we've allowed sin in the church so that we can fill the seats. I'm not trying to fill a church. I'm trying to fill heaven. And we're not going to quit talking about sin, church. And if you walk into this church living in sin and walk out not feeling convicted about it, then I haven't done my job. If you walk out of here living in sin and saying that was a good message and you didn't feel the pricking of the Holy Spirit in your heart, then either I didn't preach it strong enough or you didn't listen well enough. Because there's a lot of things that other Christians do that I'm not going to do. Because I think we're asking the wrong questions. We want to know, how close to the world can I get and still go to heaven? When the question should be is, how close can I get to God? And I, I, I hesitated to say this, but I've got pastor friends that go to places, see things, do things that I just won't do. i got my pastor friends. They're cussing preachers. I'm not a cussing preacher. They do things that I'm not comfortable with, and I'm not here to point the finger and elevate myself and say, wow, you're so lucky to have me as a pastor. But I want to run from sin, not embrace it. 
And I felt like God said to me when I saw that, I got disheartened and said, don't you worry about them. I'll deal with them. Their life is my business. Let me handle them. If you want me to work on you, you work on you. But we need to uphold a standard of righteousness. Wait, hold up, PD. A minute ago, you told me not to condemn myself with all the things that I'm doing wrong, and now you're need, telling me I need to straighten up and quit living in sin? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm talking about doing something about the things that you can do something about. If the Holy Spirit's convicted you of something, then let the power of the Holy Spirit move in your heart and move on from it. Repent. Because there are some things that you and I need to put our foot down on and tell the devil, not going to happen. And say no to the devil. Amen. Don't even flirt with sin. Yes. Deal with the devil. Don't flirt with him. Pastor Derek, it's no big deal. Everybody has issues. Everybody has struggles. Sure they do, but I'm not going to entertain them. Because when you flirt and entertain sin, you offend yourself and you offend the Holy Spirit. So we've got to set a standard. Take a standard, a biblical standard of what we believe in. Doesn't mean we've become religious prudes or legalistic, but what it does mean is that we set that biblical standard and example for others to follow. Because the devil's working overtime to drag us into all the mess of this world. So when someone wants to be critical, don't go there. When someone else wants to be judgmental of someone, don't go there. When someone wants to tell you the newest 411 and spill the tea, tell them you don't have room for that in your cup. Tell them, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to go there. I want to maintain a standard that glorifies God. Let's determine ourselves to live a life unoffended. When things pop up on your internet that you don't need to see, keep moving, keep scrolling, don't entertain it. Don't take the bait. You got to say, Pastor, I'm not going to take offense at what was said today. I'm not going to give offense to other people. And I'm not going to keep offending myself because I'm God's child. And He loves me. And He's going to work on me. I'm going to speak God's promises over my life. And I'm going to rise to be the man or woman of God that He's called me to be. Because He loves us. Even in our imperfections, He still loves us. Because we're a work in progress. So just don't hinder the progress. And keep chasing after God. Amen? Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray today that we chase after you. Father, that we let the Holy Spirit work in us. That we quit tearing ourselves down and belittling ourselves and discounting ourselves. But God, that we would learn to love who you created us to be. But always know that you want to make us better. Because you love us. Father, help us to become the best versions of ourselves because we become that version when we get in your presence and allow your word into our hearts. I'm going to ask you a question. How's your relationship with yourself? Well, it's only as strong as your relationship with God. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, he wants to know you. He loves you. You don't have to clean yourself up for him. He'll take you just as you are. and He'll, he'll forgive every sin you've ever committed and then help you work on what you need to work on. So if you need Jesus as your Savior today, you want Him to forgive you of your sins, then I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. And everybody else in the room, we're going to do it together. Let's do that. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And today I give you my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.